Um, so Anil mentioned individuals who had been uh, knighted by the queen. Um, and uh, that's the case of our next speaker, um, Professor Sir Harry Badisha, um, who spent uh, his career at the University of Cambridge and continuing I'm also at Queen Mary University of London. Thank you. Um, so uh, in addition to being a knight, um, uh, Harry is also a fellow of the Royal Society. Um, he's the only person in the history, of, he's probably the, the person in the, the history of the world that's dedicated the greatest fraction of his life to Bay Knight. <laughs> um, and uh, he's got several books uh, I encourage you to visit his website if you need information on anything. Uh, and uh, he's uh, he's always been a role model um, for me. We share the same advisor, and he's a few years ahead of me. So he was always uh, held up as a role model um, pretty much for my whole career. So, um, Harry, thank you for being here, and uh, we're looking forward to your presentation on Visionary Steels. Thank you very much, John. So uh, this is the last lecture, and you know that always puts pressure on the speaker because we had uh, amazing lectures this morning by young people, and this afternoon by very old people, <laughs> uh, and I actually belong to that uh, last group. So so it's meant as a compliment. Okay, so um, I don't know whether everyone here knows the history of the Steel Center. But when I was here, I visited the Geological Museum. And this is a picture that I took. Actually, all the pictures you'll see I have taken myself uh, are gold particles in zinc and lead sulfide. So there was a person traveling through this region, and he decided to pan the water and found gold. And that's how mining began here. And a school of mines was established uh, before the state of Colorado. Did you know that? Okay, yeah, so some of you do. So it was actually the county of Kansas and Jefferson where the mining school was established. And it was a few years later that the state of Colorado happened and became a part of the union. And that was uh, 100 and uh, so the Colorado School of Mines was 150 years ago, uh, minus 150 compared with today. And then we have, of course, uh, the steel center, which is 40 years ago, as we've heard. Now you'll see this bar chart in several of my slides as I progress. Uh, there's also a link to my website where you'll find more detail on everything that I'm going to say. Now there is a strange image on this slide, okay? And it's a unicorn. And this was a unicorn given to me by uh, Professor Jeff Greenwood, the late Professor Jeff Greenwood's family. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, it illustrates so much about steels. For example, you have uh, welded joints, okay? We've emphasized uh, welding. Um, Ojun Kwon talked about the weldability of steels. We've got little molten drops making the main of this unicorn. You can twist the iron into this shape. And if you look very closely, there are iridescent colors on the surface because of the very thin oxide films, which cause light interference. So this really is an object of art. And I can talk a lot more about this, but I have 40 minutes and I'm going to stick to that. So this illustrates uh, the beauty of steel and the versatility of steel, this uh, unicorn, which is made out of steel. And uh, I was going to bring it with me, but it's rather, rather big. But I want to show, uh, wanted to show that you can stick a magnet to it, which is uh, what, um, you know, again, Ojun Kwon talked about the magnetic properties of steel. And I might come back to that later. So, um, how do I move this? Um, okay. Now, to the vast majority of the general public, you know, they will see a steel object, and this is a picture I took in the US. And the engineering is amazing. You know, you've got all these huge pipes coming in from different directions and they're joined together by welding. You can touch it, you can feel it. But the ordinary person will think that a steel is a piece of steel, all right? 
you know, steel is steel. And even uh, maybe people at the National Science Foundation might think that. But actually there is a lot more uh, to this object. Uh, we have to look inside this to find the beautiful trillions of crystals that are inside this. And I'm talking about crystals. So how do we define a crystal? I was told yesterday in the car trip that, uh, you know, uh, some people think of crystals as magic uh, because they look so beautiful, okay? And even, even the crystals that we've seen in transmission electron microscopes look crystals. But what is the real definition of a crystal? Well, this is a book that was uh, written by Hook of Hook's Law, okay? And it was written in the year MDCLXV. <laughs> and M stands for 1,000, B for 500, C for 100, L for 50, X for 10, and V for five. So it was the year 1665 that Robert Hooke wrote this uh, book, Studies with Magnifying Glasses. And he was looking at a particular mineral and uh, he saw these beautiful facets on, on the same uh, crystal, okay? So he decided that, look, I can create all these facets by the same periodic arrangement of small objects. So this is the first clue that we have that crystals contain a periodic pattern. Okay, now we are not identifying the circles that is drawn with atoms because that's 1665, but the fact that there is long range periodicity is the definition of a crystal, okay? A long range periodicity. That was back in 1665. Now here is a regular arrangement of uh, atoms and all I need to specify the position of every single atom is a unit cell like this, okay? If I repeat this unit cell, I generate everything else. So for a crystal, all you need is a handful of positions of atoms to define the complete periodicity of the crystal. That is in contrast to an amorphous material here, where you would need to specify the position of every single atom to define that material. And amorphous means a random arrangement of atoms. Now, crystals uh, will have different properties in different directions, okay? So here, the distance between atoms is different from here, and therefore, you will have anisotropic properties, whereas the amorphous material will be isotropic. And it's those anisotropic properties which give you the beautiful facets on these iron crystals, which were brought back from the moon by the Apollo missions, okay? So these are actually pure iron crystals, not iron nickel crystals, I'll tell you a bit more about that later, brought back by the Apollo missions from the moon. And I, I wanted to use this image in my book and there's no problem with that, uh, except that I couldn't understand this at all. And I'll describe what I can't understand later. But you know, crystals need not be faceted. The aircraft that I came on, had uh, engines and the turbine blades in the hottest part of the engine are single crystals, okay? So this turbine blade is a single crystal. The reason is that boundaries, you know, are easy paths for diffusion. So under stress, the uh, uh, turbine blade would get longer. So if you get rid of all the boundaries and you make the blade as a single crystal, then you have a much better Blade. And you can grow them in the aerodynamic shape. And there are thousands of these in all of the jet engines that fly around right now. So you can have engineering beauty in this turbine blade. It doesn't have to be a nice faceted crystal, which looks magical. Now we can actually make amorphous iron, uh, um, uh, metallic glass, uh, but most of the glass that people are familiar with is, is like this, you know, it's a window glass or, or this tube. And the reason why it's transparent is, in this case, um, one reason why it's transparent is that we don't have crystals, we scatter light, okay? Okay, so that's the definition of a crystal, and we can now look at these crystals on an atomic scale. So this is an image produced uh, using the atom probe by my colleague, Bob Wall, who built the atom probe himself. And from this pattern, you can recognize what the crystal structure is. And I've uh, drawn it out over here. Uh, you can see that it's a, a 
the, you know, in the atom probe, you look at materials at a very low temperature because otherwise the atoms are vibrating, right? So you can't clearly get the resolution you want. So at low temperatures, iron is body-centered cubic. We know that, right? But this structure actually is not stable. Yeah, it shouldn't exist, right? And the reason why it's not stable, um, the, the reason why it is stable, sorry, is because I haven't drawn the electrons here. Every single ion atom here has some lonely electrons. And I want you to think about an electron as an axis with a current going round and round. Now, if you have a current going round around this axis, then you basically produced a magnetic uh, dipole, okay? And it turns out that at temperatures below about 760 degrees centigrade, uh, the spins on every single one of these atoms is aligned. And that's why we get ferromagnetism, okay? And without ferromagnetism, this structure would not be stable. And bear in mind that almost all steel is body-centered cubic. So we would not have civilization without magnetism. Okay, so you can tell that, actually you can tell a lot of what I'm going to say to your friends and your family, uh, to say, look, you know, you owe civilization to the magnetic properties of iron. Uh, if you do first principles calculations, so without magnetism, it will be the hexagonal form of iron, which would be stable on, under ambient conditions. And we know the limitations of hexagonal structures in terms of the numbers of slip systems and so forth. Now, if I heat this up, then the spins, you know, temperature makes uh, disorder. So the spins would tend to become uh, misaligned and therefore you lose paramagnetism above the Curie temperature. And another structure comes into being uh, with a little bit of superheat, which is the face-centered cubic structure, which we call austenite. And just to show you, uh, this is a movie I made in a, a children's uh, technical park in Switzerland, where if I heat the iron, it loses its magnetism, okay? Straightforward, and it goes into the austenitic state, which has very good properties. So we can, um, you know, Brielle is... Um, stainless steel, I will come back to that shortly. Now, uh, I told you I've taken all the pictures myself and that includes this uh, uh, George Krause's uh, book there being pointed at by a colleague of mine. And this was at uh, a certain uh, exhibition. And it's, uh, of course, it's uh, an important book. Uh, you know, it's one of the classics in, in the subject. And uh, I also have a picture of uh, a bamboo here. Now, why have I got a picture of a bamboo? Well, George has such passion for steels that a long time ago, you know, he wrote to this, uh, I assume that it's a newspaper called High County News, which had an article about bicycles made from bamboo frames. And, uh, you know, you, you, you can find this article on the web. I, I haven't uh, quoted the whole of it. I uh, paraphrased it here, but he said, look, I'm disturbed to see the promotion of bamboo bike frames relative to steel, and he explained why, okay? It was to do with uh, carbon. Uh, so, you know, um, you can't create a steel center without having a real passion for the subject, yeah? You have to remember that. It isn't just about uh, creating a steel center, but you really believe what you're doing. And, um, I met him actually around 1980 when he came over to Cambridge to see uh, Robert, Professor Robert uh, Honeycomb. And uh, before that, I had read a paper by him, which was uh, in 1972, where uh, he quenched a high carbon steel. And, you know, you can see microscopic cracks in the martensite plates here. Okay. And again, I'm paraphrasing here. But there was a clear statement that if I make my structure finer, then these cracks tend to disappear, okay? And that had an impression on me, and I'm going to explain why. I want to create martensite, which I quench, a high carbon martensite, which I quench, 
and I do not temper. I want to get the full strength of untempered high carbon martensite, and I want to make it ductile and have toughness at minus 40 degrees centigrade and make it weldable as Ojin Kwon said, cheap in large, uh, in all dimensions and able to be produced by mass uh, production, okay? I don't want to just make a tiny sample which uh, people who do severe deformation will study and publish papers. I want to actually produce something that will uh, be meaningful. So how do you do this, okay? These are um, a whole set. So when you're designing steel, you know, there's no point in just having uh, a chat about strength, okay? That's where graphene is a complete disaster, okay? <laughs> complete and utter disaster. Uh, you know, you claim that it is 200 times stronger, but actually it isn't. And furthermore, as soon as you make it two millimeters in size, it's lost all its properties, okay? So you spent billions actually on graphene research and there isn't a single structural application of graphene even in composites because you can't transfer stress onto a very small object. Uh, I was actually invited to give a talk at a graphene conference after I made my views uh, known. <laughs> And I, you know, nobody could challenge me on what I said. And that's what young people have to be careful about, actually, that uh, scientists these days have got into the habit of making claims which are not true because that generates money and politicians don't recognize or understand what they're saying. So my idea, uh, our idea, uh, you know, when I say my, of course, I've got students working with me, um, was that, look, um, when, I uh, when we refine the grain size here from a austenite grain size from 124 micrometers to 25, I get a huge reduction in the number of cracks. And there is some periodicity in the cracks that form in a single martensite plate. So supposing uh, that we use composite theory where you know, if you have a short fiber, then the stress at the ends of the short fiber is not very large, okay? Because you can't transfer stress at those points. Uh, so if you make your austenite grain size smaller than the distance between the cracks, then the cracking problem should disappear, okay? Now, how do we make the austenite grain size so small? You know, I want it to be 0.4 of a micrometers. How do we do that? Well, there is a very simple reason. You do hot rolling, conventional hot rolling, but you stop hot rolling at a low temperature. And, you know, people will, uh, Anil Sachter may not like that because you put big roll loads on the rolling mill, but actually you're rolling it in the austenitic condition. So the loads are not very high, okay? Um, you pancake the grains of austenite so severely that they look like this. And furthermore, you introduce huge numbers of deformation bands in the austenite. So the effective grain size that people have talked about, you know, the coherent region of the austenite crystal becomes extremely small. And you've introduced vast orientation gradients across the uh, grain and martensite cannot cross those boundaries, okay? so. The martensite that you get is extremely fine. And what I want to show you is a different way of looking at this. So these are pole figures. And um, if you came to the lectures in the morning, then we talked about uh, the orientation relationships like Nishiyama, Wasserman, and so forth. So in a single grain of austenite, you can only get 24 different orientations of plates of martensite. But if I look at this pole figure on, on um, this side, I have thousands of orientations in a single austenite grain. And that's very good because, you know, if you're looking at cleavage crack propagation, you want to deflect the crack frequently because that is doing work in creating fracture. And look at the properties, okay? Uh, so untempered high carbon martensite, we can get at minus 40 degrees centigrade, sharpy toughness of that much and elongations which are respectable and a strength level <coughs> of two gigapascals produced on a rolling mill. And uh, this is work we did a long time ago on uh, nanostructured bainite and we beat 
that I'm afraid to say, okay? It's my, Bainite is my favorite subject, but we have beaten that. Uh, we can consistently, consistently produce a toughness of 75 megapascal root meters at a strength of two gigapascals in this steel, and we can weld it using arc welding. Uh, we can also laser weld it, but laser welding is not really a very effective process. You have to fit things together very accurately and so forth. Arc welding is the best uh, for structural engineering. I'm going to show you one uh, uh, application. Uh, the reason why we started this work, okay, is to make a blast resistant steel, not a ballistic resistant, but a blast. A blast is uh, sort of a uniformly distributed sudden uh, load. So obviously in the university, we are not going to work with blasts, okay? So what we have is a simulation method in which we fire aluminum foam at a high speed onto the steel sample, which is clamped at both ends. And uh, it should not uh, break, of course, and also the deflection should not be too large because obviously, you know, if you've made a vehicle, you don't want the deflection inside to work. So this, this uh, survives this particular steel. This is only six millimeters thick here. And uh, of course, uh, there are limited applications in, in such, such a scenario. Uh, so you want to look for a civilian application. And uh, we collaborated with a university in Finland, which has very good facilities for um, abrasion testing and impact abrasion in particular, where you know, you're, you're scratching the material and at the same time you're impacting it. So you can see here that uh, abrasion damage and impact damage. Uh, in the minerals industry, this is really important, okay? And um, the equipment is you put your material inside this. Uh, this is a slowed down movie and it hits uh, granite particles, okay? So you can then uh, work out, you know, what is your weight loss and so forth uh, from such an experiment. And uh, I can tell you um, that doing experiments in a laboratory is one thing, all right? So, and therefore, collaboration with industry is really important because uh, if you're trying to make a product, there's nothing like a real test of a component, okay? Because it won't be a nice granite particle inside a tumbler with rotating things. It'll be more complicated scenarios. And we installed this plate uh, in Tata Steel where there were minerals uh, falling. And the conventional plate that they use is illustrated here, which is mild steel with hard facing coating. And you lose that in about three months, okay? Now this was put in before the pandemic. And we obviously we can't take it out too often to see what the damage is, but each time the plant was stopped for whatever reason, they took photographs and there's no visible damage on this plate. So, this is in a real application that it works. And the idea originally, you know, if you go back, um, George Krauss said that, look, if you make the structure finer, uh, you will reduce the number of microscopic cracks and all books, including mine, except for the latest edition that John has, will say that, look, uh, you know, martensite, if you quench, it's brittle, you've got to temper it, okay? Not if you make it extremely fine. Okay, now uh, I want to talk about rust. Uh, somebody did mention rust. Uh, I think it was you. Uh, so look at this, you know, it's, a, it's rust. And uh, rust actually, uh, the reason why it doesn't protect is because it actually doesn't form on the surface of the steel. It forms in the liquid ahead of the steel by these reactions, right? So it, it's not actually attached to the surface, but it looks beautiful. You know, it's, uh, it's a chocolate color here. And in fact, this is chocolate. And I may be the only one in this room who ate this nut, bolt, and washer, okay? Now, rust is really quite important, okay? If you go back two and a half billion years, you know, the atmosphere, uh, so there was no oxygen, no carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It was methane and sulfur compounds, okay? Because there was a, a large land mass, a single large land mass, and it was splitting apart and huge volcanic eruptions. And therefore, the, the atmosphere was actually methane and um, uh, noxious substances. So the sky looked uh, completely orange and 
on the land, you could find elemental metals, okay, including iron, absolutely no life at all, all right? Until in the sea, there were very uh, single-celled, um, um, single-celled living things, okay, <laughs> which decided to mutate and synthesize uh, by uh, photosynthesis uh, cl using chlorophyll, okay? So they started generating oxygen. Uh, you can see the bubbles rising from under the, uh, um, from over the seabed. But, you know, this oxygen did not make it to the surface. Do you know why? Does anybody know why this oxygen did not make it to the surface? There was no life on land, okay? Not even plants. Because the sea contained a lot of dissolved iron, huge quantities of dissolved iron and uh, other metals, but iron was the dominant thing in solution. So as this oxygen was released, it formed iron oxide, which then sank. And that's what you know the Brazilians and Australians mine, the layers of iron oxide which sank. It's only after the iron oxide was consumed that the oxygen could make it to the surface. And then only after the methane, et cetera, was eliminated by oxygen, which is very active, that we had oxygen in the atmosphere and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the blocking of uh, the UV uh, light that um, Ojun Kwon talked about. And then and then only did plants appear on the surface of the earth and even the complex oxides uh, that are in the crust and the, which are not found on any other planet in the solar system form because oxygen combined with all elements like silicon and so forth. So you should tell your friends that they owe their absolute existence to rust. Okay, without that, you would not actually exist. Okay, uh, so the BBC has made a series of five amazing documentaries uh, on the earth going back four and a half billion years ago, worth watching. Okay, now uh, when I visited the Colorado School of Mines, uh, there was a guy called uh, David Matlock, yeah, <laughs> who uh, decided that I should see the um, Rocky. Uh, National Park, and in fact, my daughter is uh, somewhere there right now. Um, and uh, you know, it's beautiful. <coughs> but the thing that interested me was not that, not the mountains and the snow and all the rest of it. It was the fencing and, <laughs> and this building here. And uh, the guy from US Steel, where are you? Yeah. So this particular steel was invented by U.S. Steel, okay? And it's called uh, weathering steel, or the trade name is Corten, all right? And it has got a slight difference in chemistry, which means that the rust forms in a compact manner, and therefore it isolates the iron from further corrosion. So this requires no maintenance over a period of 40 years. Absolutely brilliant. And the colors completely match the woodland surroundings. Okay. I've got movies of this and so forth. And uh, I decided I would give a talk at the Worshipful Company of Ar uh, Armorers and Braziers, which is in London. Uh, and I'm a freeman of that company. Uh, so that means I can drive sheep over the uh, London Bridge if I wanted to. Okay. And this company was founded in 1322. And I gave the talk about, uh, you know, this uh, visit to the um, Rocky Mountains and the amazing performance of this court and steel. And at the end of it, you know, the master of the company uh, thanked me and so forth. And he said, look, you don't have to go to Colorado. Uh, go to the old wall of London, which is five minutes from here. And you'll see a pedestrian bridge here, which is made out of cotton. So this is the old wall of London, which is uh, 1800 years before today. Okay, which was built 1800 years before today. And this is the beautiful cotton bridge. 
If you go to the biomedical campus in Cambridge, you know, the buildings are made using uh, weathering steel. So rust is important, okay? And here is another good reason. So Cambridge is the most cycled city in the whole of the UK. And it's also the city in which the bicycles are stolen the most, okay? So I have a very ugly bicycle, okay? And for more than 25 years, nobody's bothered to steal it. So it's covered in rust, okay? But it's actually a very nice bike, you know, the gears, the dynamo, and the brakes are all in the hub, okay? And you can change the gears if you are stationary. So, so I tell my students, you know, when they first come to Cambridge from somewhere else, that you need to buy an ugly bicycle, not, uh, not one that looks fancy. Okay, uh, now people from Colorado School of Mines get everywhere. And uh, I was uh, based uh, in uh, South Korea four months a year for more than 10 years, uh, courtesy of, uh, you know, POSCO and uh, POSTEC, where they created a graduate institute of ferrous technology. And this is a, a, a press, a digital um, press uh, for formability studies, where a guy called Rick, now I don't know if it's the same Rick who was mentioned earlier, uh, but he was in charge of running this press uh, from the Colorado School of Mines uh, for formability studies. And formability is extremely important, uh, as, as we all know. Uh, now, these are the gang from Colorado School of Mines, including, uh, you know, Emmanuel, who are in my office in South Korea, okay? And they came to give a talk about, uh, you know, the amazing, highly original idea that came from here on the quenched and quench and partitioning process, okay? Uh, so, you know, it isn't just uh, something that, um, industry might feed into Colorado School of Mines, but there are amazing ideas which germinate in an environment like this. And quentin partitioning is uh, one of them. And, you know, um, um, this, this morning, uh, um, Adira, and I think her second name was Balzac. Yeah, she explained the process. So I'm not going to go into it in detail, but in principle, it's very simple. You quench, uh, to partially transform into martensite, you heat it up so the carbon from the martensite escapes into the austenite and enriches it, and then you cool it so a little bit more of martensite forms, and you've stabilized austenite, okay? Uh, and that has uh, beneficial properties. And this idea uh, was not just uh, invented and experimented on, but the theory for this was developed here. Uh, I've shown you some equations which I've put in two of my books, okay, uh, which come from the work done here. And um, John Spear was awarded the Gibbs Award for this. Now, I don't know if you know about Gibbs, but uh, obviously he did thermodynamics, all right? But actually he was a, a mathematician and um, the first person in the US to get a doctorate in engineering, okay? An amazing uh, set of achievements uh, by one person. So you can compare him to, for example, Maxwell and Einstein and so forth. They all contributed to what was happening. Einstein wouldn't have thought about certain problems without Gibbs and Maxwell, for example. So John Spear in the Colorado School of Mines has the Gibbs Award. Okay, so there's something special about this place. And um, this is uh, Matlock and, uh, you know, we went in his uh, car and it, it, I've got a very, very interesting story about this. And, you know, we've already seen um, from Anil's talk that steel actually has no challenges. And I can say that with a hand on my heart because the vast majority of new materials are just for university studies, okay? And uh, aluminum is important, nickel alloys are important, but they are small in comparison with the quality of life that you gain from steels. Uh, so we were going in his car, yeah? And um, it is 20 years old, 
So I've put it on the time scale here. Okay, it's 20 years old. And he said something to me, uh, which uh, really stuck in my mind, and I'm going to explain why. So he said, uh, look, uh, you know, I can probably buy a more fuel efficient car. But if you think about the CO2 cost of actually making the car, it doesn't make sense. You know, you won't recover that CO2 cost. And this is a very important point. You know, we should not abuse steel, okay? Simply because someone says, look, this is slightly more fuel efficient. And I'm going to give you a concrete example of how to solve the problem of CO2 in four years without any pain. It's not going to be hydrogen and it's not going to be electrolysis and we can't wait till 2050 or 2060. And the poorest people in the world will suffer if we don't do something, okay? So we need to reduce steel consumption by 25% without affecting the quality of life or uh, causing pain to industry. Magic, isn't it? Yep. Right, now we had, um, you know, Adam uh, uh, Church and uh, Emma um, Courtney and uh, Quinn Britt this morning talk about micro alloying steels, right? Now this is a revolution in steels which should have won the Nobel Prize. I've written that in my books, all right? Because, <laughs> you know, there's probably about 30 billion tons of this material in service and nobody knows about it because it's so reliable that you don't need to worry about it like the operating system on your telephone, okay? <laughs> uh, if you had to replace a bridge as many times as your operating system, you know, you would be worried. Now, this is a real case study that I'm going to show you, and there are more case studies in the book that I've given to John. So here a building was put up, a real building, and I've been there, where, you know, the ordinary steel that is normally used was replaced with micro alloyed steel, which is stronger. And this is the actual building which has uh, been put up. And since this story, which is in my book in detail, um, there have been other buildings built on the same principle, even though you could not buy beams large enough, they welded them up, okay? And now you can buy welded beams of micro alloy steel, which are really large so that you can make tall buildings. And the point is, that micro alloy steel is more expensive, okay? So immediately, you know, the design engineers will think no, we, or, or their managers will think no, we can't use this material, it's more expensive. I don't like people talking about how expensive steel is and how expensive alloying elements are. You have to look at the whole life cost, okay? So these are uh, summarized figures. So if they had used ordinary steel, they would have used, uh, 360,000 kilograms with micro alloy steel, you use a lot less and you save 130,000 kilograms of CO2. Uh, and scaling by the ordinary steel, you use 78%. So even though it is costly, you use, you save money by using micro alloy steel, okay? Common sense, okay? You can reduce steel consumption by 25% in two ways. One is by sponsoring good research, which creates new steels, which can replace old steels. Um, the examples that Anil Suchet have used uh, are for the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, I mean, there are many, many examples uh, which are in my book actually. And the second thing is, you know, <clears throat> we need to have legislation. So, you know, the reason why you started to use strong steels for cars is legislation. It's not because you decided, okay, um, if the truth be told. So there was legislation that you must have this level of fuel efficiency. So my proposal, and I've presented it in many places and also a, a half an hour BBC interview, which you can uh, listen to, is that you put a cost, <coughs> a tax, on the steel content of any object that's produced locally or imported. Tariffs are no good, okay? Uh, they, they don't cause a reduction in steel, they just cause the steel to be more expensive. By putting a tax on anything that's manufactured either locally or uh, imported, you make the designers think, okay? There already are steels which you could substitute for poor quality uh, or seals which are not properly used. And that tax money 
doesn't go into government coffers, but goes to industry, local industry, to improve their technologies. So everybody is happy, okay? Um, still, con uh, the consumers will pay a slightly more price, but you know, you are already paying huge costs for electrical cars. Double the cost of petrol engine cars. And nobody complains about this, okay? Nobody complains. In Britain, by 2035, there will be no petrol engine cars sold. It, it wasn't discussed by anyone in the election campaigns that you are going to pay double the price for an electrically powered car than a petrol engine car car. So people, my, uh, my uh, positive interpretation of this is that people will be happy to pay more if the environment uh, is saved in the process, in the time scale that is necessary. Now, here is another example. <clears throat> the most powerful rocket ever built and launched, ever built, okay? Um, if you ask uh, a, school, a school child or a um, high school child, you know, what are rockets made out of? They will probably say aluminum. Actually, it's uh, most, almost all rockets are made of aluminum lithium alloys, okay? Uh, which um, for, for their specific strength, that means strength divided by density. This is the largest rocket ever built and it's made from stainless steel, okay? Three millimeters thick. And I've had a long conversation with the head of materials at uh, SpaceX, who is Charlie Cuman, and he's also the head of materials at uh, Tesla. And he gave me lots of information which I could put in my book. And I told him not tell me anything that he can't, uh, that I can't write about, because I can't keep a secret, okay? <laughs> so, so this is three millimeters thick. And the amazing thing is that uh, past attempts to do this, you know, the rocket simply collapses under its weight if it's not pressurized. This does not, okay? It's, it's cold rolled, almost like 316L, but it's not 316L because you need ductility at cryogenic temperatures as well, because you know, you've got liquid oxygen. Uh, and that gives it a strength of the order of two gigapascals. Fabrication is trivial. You buy, you know, off the shelf lasers and robots to put these things to do together, and the well heat affected zone does not matter. I've, I can't go into detail now, but it's in my book. All right. Um, so, this is supposed to be reusable. At the moment, you know, the three launches haven't uh, succeeded in recovering. So, this is a good way, you know, of progressing. And if this was made of aluminum, you would have to have friction stir welding equipment, which extended for the complete height of this object. And it would take more than three years to manufacture those machines, okay? So they could not wait for that. And they had a clever solution. And, you know, somebody said that you can't form this. Uh, I, I'm going to blame you again, Anil. Yes, <laughs> uh, it's very, very strong. So what do they do, you know? Uh, the Cybertruck looks really weird, right? The reason is you can't form this, you can only bend it. But I've looked at this carefully and the aerodynamics, um, not only going through uh, moving, but also staying on the ground is important, is better than any other normal truck, okay? so. People are attracted by the shape. Some people are attracted by the shape. <laughs> but it's a consequence of the fact that this is really strong. So all credit to them for thinking differently. Now, um, this is in uh, civil aircraft engines and they are huge, okay? And uh, the shaft in the middle is made of steel, but uh, you need two kinds of steels. One is uh, AMET 100, which is really tough. Okay, and the other is a uh, chrome moly steel, which uh, can resist higher temperatures. And you know, there are so many requirements here. I'm going to only mention one, that if you have a fan blade uh, coming off, then the engine goes into massive vibrations. So the shaft has to be able to bend plastically and it's a very, very big shaft, okay? Uh, so that's quite an amazing demand. 
So what they do is they, um, this isn't actually off the shelf, but I'm just illustrating the process. You take these two steels and they're rotated against each other and you uh, friction weld them together and then you machine off the excess, okay? So it's a, it's a dirty process, but it's doable and it has been done in the past. So we wanted to make a, a shaft which will serve both high temperature and low temperature ends of the engine. And we did it, okay? Um, uh, and we have three granted patents. So this is just one example of a patent. And it relies on uh, something that normal people would regard as a bad thing in steels. It's called a Z phase. It's, it's a, an intermetallic compound, but we made it so fine that it actually helps. Uh, a combination of Z phase and another nickel aluminum intermetallic compound. And look, these are actual blanks of the shaft. And once they are completed, you know, they, it has to be, I said to you, it has to have many properties. And one of them is machinability, because you are going to have to uh, make it into the right sort of configurations. So that is now uh, a shaft in engines. Now, this shows a destructed coral reef, okay? So I'm still sticking to the issue of density because the stainless steel rocket, you know, its specific strength is better than that of the aluminum alloys that you use in, um, uh, for example, the Falcon 9, a Falcon 9 rocket, okay? So the strength to weight ratio easily matches that of aluminum lithium alloys. Uh, and so the density doesn't matter. You can still make a rocket. This is another application where the density of steel is a huge advantage. So this is coral reef, which has been destroyed either by mining or by using dynamite for blast fishing. And what you do, uh, and these are pictures which I have permission to use uh, from the Ocean Oceanographic Institute, is you take ordinary rebar, okay, make it into that shape, and you attach to it uh, live coral, okay, and then you place it on the seabed. And that coral will, so this won't get washed away because of the density of the steel. This is what happens after a few years. Can you see in this image the remnants of the steel? Okay, if you look carefully, look. Yeah, okay. This is absolutely remarkable. And large areas near Indonesia have been uh, re coralled. And uh, recently there was a report on the BBC of another area near Brazil where the coral has been regenerated. So, you know, things that we think about steel, which are, uh, you know, rust and uh, uh, to which you owe your existence and density are not a problem if you engineer the steel. Going back to these moon crystals, the thing that I just could not bear is I could not explain these five-sided faces, okay? Five is not a number that long range symmetry is comfortable with, all right? Uh, so I thought about it, thought about it, I still couldn't decide. So what do you do when you get stuck with a problem? Well, you phone a friend and this is uh, Kevin Knowles who worked hard on this problem for three months. And, you know, uh, NASA, NASA's uh, crystals uh, were published, but no one has solved these faces for more than 50 years. So we solved it, taking account of projection problems and so forth. And they come out really strange, two to nine. Okay. Now, why would a self-respecting crystal, which has actually grown from vapor inside the cavities in the rocks, why would it have a face of two to nine and not one, one, one or something like that, a close back face? Well, these are growing from vapor, okay? And if you have a, a face like this, <coughs> it will not have a flat surface, it will have steps, okay? So it's actually consisting of different crystallographic faces and you can attach atoms more easily on steps than on flat faces. So um, we published a paper and uh, I explained to everybody when I gave a talk that, look, this is not going to change life as we know it, all right? And uh, this paper probably will never get cited. But there's one request I have to the museum here is that I also took this picture of the moon rock. 
I would like to have it and section it and look at it in more detail to get the actual crystal. So I'm expecting you to work on that problem, okay? <laughs> so uh, so um, I didn't imagine it would have any consequences at all, okay? It was published uh, late last year, but I found a citation of this paper from some scientists working at Technion in Israel. So I contacted them. They were very pleased to give me all the information and images. And this is what they are trying to do. They want to create strange faces on platinum crystals, which are used in catalysis, because strange faces might have different catalytic properties. So the way they do it is uh, they put, it, uh, put these uh, very, very tiny platinum crystals uh, between platins and press the faces on. And of course, they have to do the work to show that there is a change, but this is the first stage of the work. And they were really pleased uh, that uh, I would talk about them. And, uh, you know, the, uh, Jonathan is the student and uh, Eugene is the professor. And Eugene told me that, uh, you know, the student will be very happy to have his work talked about, okay? <clears throat> now, this is a movie uh, that I took uh, by putting my phone on the dining table on the 60th floor of a building in Moscow where there was really bad weather, you know, strong winds and heavy rain. And I'm going to show you what I noticed. So I noticed that the candelabra was not stationary under the influence of all this wind and so forth. And the answer is uh, really quite simple, that um, even though steel has a large elastic modulus, if it is very, very long, you know, you will get deflections, all right? So even in the very big aircraft, you know, if you look at the aircraft on the ground, the wings will be like this, okay? And they will rise when the aircraft flies. So it's not flying because of the flapping of the winds, but it's a consequence. Okay, so um, if you make really tall buildings, you've got to do something about this problem because um, you know you will get deflections which are not tolerable. All right. So I uh, this is the um, this is the building in uh, Taiwan, uh, Taipei 101 with 101 floors, and I was very lucky that uh, my students were involved in this construction, my former students. So I was allowed to go in there while it was being constructed. And this is the object that I want to talk about. So it's a 600 ton steel ball, which is suspended from the 92nd floor uh, and connected to uh, dampers. So it's a tuned damper, which compensates, okay? So actually the building doesn't shake, uh, even in an earthquake. Uh, there is a movie, uh, actually there was an earthquake while this was being built and there's a movie. Now, the other thing I want to say, Anil, I'm having a go at you because I enjoyed your talk, okay? <laughs> so this is additively manufactured, the largest object ever additively manufactured. So you just cut out steel plates in different diameters and then you join them up with a weld, okay? Straightforward, largest ever additively manufactured object. Uh, and the, these are my, uh, some of my, uh, my former students in Taiwan. Now, of course, uh, uh, the Taiwanese know that this is a really good story. So what do they do? They painted this gold. So last year when I visited, it's actually a tourist attraction. Even the steel ropes, which are perlite, uh, you know, uh, I think somebody talked about the steel ropes being two and a half gigapascals in strength. I think it was Ojun Kwan. Yeah. The, uh, I've got a book coming out in October on perlite where you can find many more details. But this is a big tourist attraction. Okay. Uh, and I have permission again to use all these images from, from the um, owner of Taipei type 101. Okay. Finish off. I think I'm using up now the last minutes of my 40 minutes. Uh, I haven't had the opportunity to talk about all the other adventures I've had at Colorado School of Mines. Uh, so on, on, on this side, you can see the little Finlays when they visited my college, the Darwin College in uh, Cambridge. And here they are sitting on furniture where probably Charles Darwin sat because 
Darwin College is founded in the buildings where the Darwin family lived. Okay, so I explained to them that they might be sitting on the same furniture as Charles Darwin. Uh, these are uh, people who I met and had uh, long conversations with. I don't know if anybody in this image is here. There you go, okay? Uh, so you can confirm that we had a good time, right? Yeah, uh, and um, you know, uh, I've known um, Dave Olson for a long time because I also did a lot of welding research, a different kind of welding research than him, but we used to be at many conferences and Stephen Liu also was involved heavily in welding. And we have Amy and Dave. And Amy provided me with some really nice movies on uh, her studies um, using um, you know neutrons and so forth um, for my YouTube channel, which is Badisha123. Okay, so <laughs> now um, academic work uh, is very tiring. Okay, so every time I feel uh, tired, I think of David uh, David over there because these are there's a huge collection of samples which are failed by fatigue. Okay, which uh, you don't find anywhere else. You know, these are massive samples. Okay, uh, so I I was able to photograph them thoroughly. And here's the picture of the office of um, George Krauss when he wasn't there, unfortunately. So I took a picture of his office. Okay? <laughs> and um, I will let uh, David uh, tell you the story about this blue screen of death when we were traveling on a train between uh, Calcutta and Jamshedpur after meeting by random chance in Calcutta. Literally, we backed onto each other, okay? Do you remember that? Yeah. Um, but this is a really good story because recently there was a blue screen of that uh, event uh, and he thought of me, okay? <laughs> so, and um, in the Geological Museum where I took huge numbers of photographs, this is a picture of cuprite because I was teaching um, the space group symmetry of crystals uh, back in Cambridge, and cuprite was an example. Uh, so he managed to get the museum to open the doors so that I could take a good photograph. And if you look at my YouTube lectures, uh, lectures on crystallography, you'll find me talking about uh, and this image being used in the stuff about space group symmetries. So I will stop there now, but thank you all very much. It's really nice to see you here. So we can reserve the questions for the panel. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, I think you've all earned a short break.